Rams TV meets Kevin Clifton McMen. Unless the Kevin and Leslie Clifton don't call him, he's coming Ted. I think we always do. But you've got to remind us, I know I've asked you this question before, Kevin Clifton McMen. And actually, I've followed you this morning and your registration is KCM. So you do refer to it, but just remind us of the story of how it became Ted. Well, when I was a lot younger and um, my granddaughter's age, I, I would play football up in Dumfries, where I was brought up, where we had a teddy bear under my arm, which was, it, it's like, I think a lot of kids nowadays have a, a blanket or an eagle piggle or something like that, but I had a teddy bear that I would never let go. And then I used to play football and people would say, put it down, I wouldn't know. And then it, I, I got, uh, well, I'd, I'd done something at a turn one day and my granny put it in the fire. Um, and it absolutely broke my heart. But people just say, that's the way I've got to run. Like like I've still got something in my arm. And, and it was called Teddy when I was a young lad anyway, because I had this teddy bear. And then I got to 11, 12, people started calling me, cut it down to Ted, and which was a lot happy. But a lot of the kids at school call me Teddy, Teddy bear all the time. And um, it's just something that's, that's stuck in a very, there's only my dad ever called me Kevin. Um, which I was never going to argue because it was my dad, but if anybody ever else called me Kevin, I knew they were there to wind me up, which you've probably just started something again <laughs> that'll probably come to light. Mm, no, I've always called you Ted for however many years that we've known each other, which is probably getting on for about 30 years, which is a bit Th frightening. 30 years, and like I was saying earlier on, that you, I've spent more time probably with you than I have with my wife Marion, so it doesn't really look good, does it? <laughs> well, we'll get on to those stories a bit later on. Um, the Tin Man, where did that come from? Again, it's, it, it's a Rangers thing that people just seen the way I run, either like, again, a, a running style. Um, so, again, they ain't bad names to have because there's a lot worse you could have. Um, but at Rangers, it was, I'd never forget, before the Cup final, it was the Tin Man and Roy Aitken, um, like a picture of me with a suit arm, armour. Um, but then you watch the Wizard of Oz and you think, well, I don't know, is it something out of that? Or there's just so many people or because he drinks out of tins of beer or they, you, you would count and somebody would always come up with a different excuse. So, But like, again, it, it's no, nothing that's ever harmed me and it's something that's followed me. And when I go back to Scotland with Rangers, people say, all right, Tin Man. And that's, it'll just keep on going like that. Is that where it started with the tie Brocks? Yeah, it started there and it, it carried on. And Seville, they didn't even know what a Tin Man was or a Ted or it was just like, so, and I didn't even know what they were saying. So it was just something that it held Ted over there and it was something that stayed with me. At Derby, it was never Tin Man it, until later on, really. And it was, again, Ted stuck and it's, uh, it's not bad. The book, if I seem to remember, I got two, you did a book mid 2000s. Um, and one have got Derby side to it, one have got a Rangers side to it, and again, reference to the Tin Man. Yeah, Rangers was, when we went up in Scotland, it'd be the front, of the, it'd be the front cover, and when we were in Derby, we'd just change the covers over, and it'd be, but it was only two towns that, that, that I thought, when we'd done the book in 2008, that would be the most, the more interesting, because of the Rangers connection, and because I'd been in Derby for, well now, going on nearly 30 years so and it was the best thing we done was if we went to Birmingham I'd have probably came back with them so it was pointless going there <laughs> um so it was, it was one of them things that we decided and and I think it was it was good and it was different so you uh, we'll, we'll obviously talk about your clubs in detail but Birmingham you don't hold in great affection no I hate the place I absolutely hated going there to training um it was worse when Barry Fry came in because it was just it was just back to what you done when you were an amateur. You put, you take your top off, and make it a goalpost. You didn't know where you were training. Um, Birmingham were in a mess, and I went there really. I'm leaving here, leaving Derby, to go there to get football because I wasn't getting football here. But to go there, I knew within six, seven weeks that I've done the worst thing I'd ever done. And as a player, I didn't really know how to get out of that. But it's it's a place that. I just didn't enjoy going. Fans never took to me. Um, and the worst thing, that I had to go across down the road at A52 to the Red Dogs, and I got absolutely abused for being a Derby reject. And that was the hardest thing ever to accept from them. While we're talking about your favourite club down the A52, 
Um, I always remember a story that Graham Richards always used to regale about a game where Derby Forest at the city ground and Stuart Pearce completely cleans you up and you're lay on the floor and Pearce comes and gets you by your shirt and pulls you up and the referee was somebody key and he books you. Yeah, well, we, like, right, he used to go to England, and, the England camp and come back and Pearce and him must have spoke about when the Derby Forest game was coming up. And right, he'd say he's going to get you. And, and that never really helped me. But we used to always do the training and after we used to say, right, you play in the right, Ted. And I'd say, I quite like playing in the left. And he'd say, you play in the right, Gary Micklewhite's on the left. And then it would be a matter of, I know I'm going to get clattered. It's how soon I'm going to get hit and how high I'm going to jump. And right, he'd say, he's going to come and get you and he'll get you early on. And it was either, it was at the city ground because he loved it there. And I remember he came, he took me out. I hit the ball by him. Try to jump about four feet high. He went a bit higher, and then I landed. I landed on top of him, and he actually bit me in the chest. Which, I, if it was nowadays, he'd get a twelve-game ban, and he bit me. And the referee came up, and I said to the referee, "He's bit me," and he says, "Oh, shut up, and behave." And I got booked, and I'm thinking, "I don't. Know, he just cleared me up, and he's got nothing." But it was every game, and then but Pearcey would pick you up and say, "I'll be back. You get back up. I'll be back," and then it'd be I'd be like, "So going to Gary Michael White, let's switch." <laughs> and Gary would go, no thanks. And then Arthur would go, no, nope, you stay there. And and it, and I had so much respect for the man. He, the man was a the hardest player I've ever played against, but a fair player that loved his club, like I loved loved my club. But he was just one of them guys that you knew when he when when he run out with short sleeve shirt on, either it be December, everybody else has got long sleeve shirts on. You knew you were in for a game. And when he scored, he would just wind the crowd up so much and. But that's the way he was a player, and he was a fantastic player. So once the game was over, you were in the bar after, there was no after, so that was it, job done? Well, I didn't speak to them. No. I went to go in the bar over there and gave him money. I would uh, I go to Nottingham as quick as I could, and that was just the way it was. We'd I hated it over there. I hated the whole club. I hated going there. Even when, when we worked on the radio, I just hated the whole place. And then going and getting stuck there... And my young lad was there actually, the game that went with Birmingham and I just got so much abuse that it's just one of the bits that wherever I go somewhere, I'll never go through Nottingham. I'll go the long way that maybe takes my next hour, but they ain't my favourite club in the in the world. That's unbelievable really, because you're not from Derby, so it's the sort of feelings that us Derby folk are supposed to have about Forest, but it clearly got to you. Well it did, I never, we never, I never beat them. I was never in a team that beat them. I'd never forget Craig Ramage scoring at the baseball ground. Yeah. Never. I've got a point against them in 88, 89 season. We drew one all over there. Don't know how we got on it. Can't remember how we got on at the baseball ground. Never ever beat them. I just would love to have beat them. Um, and just to celebrate and be in their faces like they were always in our faces. I mean, they had, they had a good team. And we were, we, we had a great, well, we had a good team that season, 88, 89. Um, but it was just one of them things, if I want to beat a club anymore, it was them, and I never ever got anything off them. Mm, I know that feeling well. All right, let's rewind. Queen of the South. How do you end up at Queen of the South playing football? Just tell us about your younger days. Home club. It was, a, it was something that I would go along and, I, like, as a, as a, I signed amateur at 14, which is too, it's so young. Um, to play against men and, and at 16 I never got a game for two years I was on the bench they made a track suit my, my size which kind of dropped me in it thinking I ain't going to get a lot of games here if they've made a track suit to fit me for two years and then I played amateur and then my dream was always to be a footballer signed up to work in a sawmill uh, had trials with clubs knock back after knock back but kept on going and then went to, played next level up which is semi-pro at Glen Afton, um, had a few trials at bigger clubs, failed again, and then Queens came knock at the door and said, "Would you come in, come to us?" I had a chance to go to Commander. I said no, because it was eighty mile away and I'd have to be there three times a week. So I decided to go to my home club because I knew that I'd be in the first team, and you're always in the shop window. So go there, local boy. There were only four local lads the rest off in Glasgow. So I went there, signed, and, and it was it was the best thing I've ever done. I read a story that, was it Queen of the South paid something like £325 and it bought a new carpet or something for the club room? 
bought a new carpet. They, 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 it's three hundred twenty-five pound. You got the thousand lottery tickets wrong there, Colt. Um, so it was three hundred, and the them thousand lottery tickets were well, a lot of money. So it, it, the club were gutted that that's why they got they got a new carpet for their, their director's room, and they, they, the worst about the, the thousand lottery tickets were all out of date. So that didn't really go down too well. So <laughs> it that was, but to them for a junior club that was that was good money because it's there you're going then from I was my level was just stepping up to. To, to being, a pro, well, no, a full-time professional, but a, a part-time professional footballer. So for us south of the border, tell us where Queen of the South is. Right on the border. You just go over, you get into God's country, um, and you turn left at Gretna, and you go by Gretna as quick as you can, unless you get married, and then you're 30 miles, you're into, into Dumfries, and um, that's where I was brought up. And like I say, very few local lads played for the club. They were all from Glasgow and, and Edinburgh. So for me to go and watch them as a kid um, and then actually play for them was something that I always wanted to do. For saying it's God's country, you've spent more than half your life down here with us. Like. I have. It's now 30 years uh, to 25 years to, to England. So when you I go back... You've got to be doing something, right? I, I think it's... Marion hid my passport, so I can't go back to Scotland. So um, it, no, it's just... Listen, the kids will always say when you come back home. To me, this is this is my home now. It's thirty years, and if I didn't enjoy it, I'd have, I'd have went back to Scotland. I have said this to so many people. You're a former Derby player who stayed in Derby. I think Derbyshire people are completely different, as in the fans will come up and you no know, say hello and things like that, and then that's it. It's no, you know, somebody in your ear for the next hour, two hours. It's just, and it's. For me, it's as long as I, when I went by about ten years here, I thought I've got East Midlands on the doorstep, Birmingham's around the corner. You got well, it's not around the corner. I wish it was further away, but you got Manchester, airport-wise to go anywhere. If I want to fly to Scotland, I can just go to East Midlands and fly to Scotland in forty-five minutes. So I just it's just one of these places that it's comfortable, it's home, and it'll always be my home. Back to Dumfries, you said you worked in a sawmill. Yeah, I'd, um, I was lucky enough to get a job uh, because I left school with no education, which I regret. But no go to school, you're not going to get an education. And you I didn't go to school? No, I'd, I just didn't see any. I'd go on sports day and I'd go when it was PE. But other than that, I didn't see any point because I, I struggled reading and writing. So I thought, what's the point of going to school? Because I don't know what they're teaching me. So, but when it was football day, I would always be there for trials, and then I would be there a Saturday morning to play for the, the school team, and that was that was just the way of life then. So, but I regret it, and, I, and the, it's my two kids. I would say to them, get an education. The first thing you've got to get education, get a job. Did they? Yeah, they've got a job, and Kevin works abroad a lot, and, and Dana's got two kids now, but they've got they, she's got a job, and she's got the two two granddaughters to look after, but. They done exactly the opposite of what I done. They went to school, they got an education, and um, and Kevin tried a bit of semi pro football, but they, I think a lot of it, they always thought that Kevin was going to be a part of me and played like me, but he was complete. He was never going to be a winger. He, he was a centre half and a centre half that never got booked. So centre halves get booked because they're dirty. <laughs> Tell Mark right that. Um, so you were down here, they were up there. Did you miss them? Yeah, of course I missed them. I still miss them. I mean, nowadays it's it's exactly the same. They're, they're older now, but in football I was selfish. It was never about the, anybody else. It was always I was always driven by me and where I was ever going to go. So the kids kind of were always no second, but I was always go where I thought that I would get a game at football and where I would be comfortable and things like that. So, but yeah, I miss them every single day. They're my kids and my my, my grandkids. So. But that's uh, football. When it was football, it was all about football. It was nothing else. So, quite selfish. Very selfish, because when I was younger, I was getting rejected, rejected after club after club, and coming trials, and no making it. And I thought, right, I've made it. They ain't anybody got to take it off me now. And if I had a chance to go to Hearts when I left uh, Birmingham, but I thought, what's the point of going back up there? I'm, that's a step back the way, even though I was in the. The end of my career, it was a step back the way and I just found it 
why do I want to step back the way if I can keep at the level I'm at the now? So you got to play for Queen of the South and then along come Glasgow Rangers. How did that come about? It was just, again, playing with Queen's first team. Uh, and the, I mean, and the day Arthur was, look, Arthur was watching me then. Arthur at, Cup. At, yeah, at Newcastle, which I knew I would look up nearly every second game. I'd look up and the same person was there. I would then ask what scouts were here because the scouts would always go in the director's box because there was nobody else there at Palmerston because there wasn't enough fans. So most of the director's box was scouts. And this man, I looked at all the time, I'm thinking, I've seen him before. Never knew who it was or whatever. And then Arthur left, Jackie Charlton took over. Arthur must have came to Derby then. And then Derby, uh, Queen's play Newcastle and a game Jackie Charlton was going to decide if I was going to go to Newcastle, which I found, found it a bit, a bit strange that there, but people like Gaza, Beardsley was playing. And at the end of the game, the, the director came to me and said, Newcastle, go on you. I thought, fair enough. Weekend after that, I'd knock at the door and it was um, the, two, the two directors at Queen's saying, you're going to Ibrox tomorrow. Without saying, do you want it? They just said, we'll pick you up in the morning, you're going to Ibrox, sign for Rangers. And I said, no, my dad will take me. Because I didn't see that these these guys are merely saying, we're, this is where you're going. They're not telling me what to do in my life. My dad came back from work, told my dad and said, I'm going to Rangers. And he said, what, Berwick Rangers? And now, Glasgow Rangers. So straight away, it was never a, I'm not going to sign. It was, when can I sign? And of course, Rangers were playing Inter Milan. So Jock wasn't there. So the director signed me and I had to go back down to Dumfries, tell my work that I was packing at the sawmill, which was probably the hardest thing in my life to tell them that I was losing £15 a week <laughs> for working 60 hours. And um, they just, they, I said, how much notice do you have to give? And he said, well, can you be working another week? I said, keep it. You can keep your £15. And then I went to Rangers and, um, and for me that was, they were one of the biggest clubs in the world and for me it was a, it was a dream come true. You mentioned Jock, Jock Wallace, he, he was the one who signed you, in fact actually signed you again later in your career. Yeah, Jock signed me and like I say, I went up there and signed and I had never met Jock before so I'm signing for a director. Um, everything was agreed, everything was capped then days, it wasn't a matter of we'll give you this, we'll give you that, everything was capped. There was never going to be a no anyway, there was never going to be a question, didn't have an agent, didn't wasn't good enough to have an agent. So it was just a matter of where they're signing, how long they're signing for, five-year contract. So I'm thinking, I've, I've done it. I've, I've signed for a big, big club, so I must have something. And uh, and then Jock came back. The Rangers had lost 3-0. Jock came back. The Thursday I met him for the first time. An absolute fantastic guy. Um, and it, just, it was just one of them things. He just thought, ex-army, same age as my dad. It just the man was a legend at Rangers already, he'd won trophies and and I thought, looked around a bit and thought, I couldn't have come to a better place. From the outside, he looked like a sergeant major character. Oh, he was he was everything was just he was just brilliant. He was just a he was a player's he would do anything for a player. He would you know, everything with the trenches and whatever, he was just he shook your hand, he he kinda of broke your hand. But he was just a winner in every stage, and he was just a guy that he, 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 he I enjoyed playing for. And if he played bad, he certainly knew about it for a good few days after. No, just an hour. It was a few days, and when he had a good game, he was the first person to pat you in the back and and saying that's what I want. Who else was there at Rangers at the time? Coyster was there. Um, I think Gordon Ramsay was actually there as a kid, um, playing with the reserves or. Never made it first team. Um, a lot of the players at Rangers, it was one of them, Rangers were, were struggling really at the time. They were going through, the crowds were down to about 10, 15,000. Um, but player wise, Coyster was there, Robert Pritch of Swede, Jim Bett, all players that a lot of people down here would probably never heard because a lot of people then didn't they come down to the, the south. They stayed up there because it was Scottish football then was a lot of health than it is now. How unnerving was it to go to somewhere like Ibrox to Glasgow Rangers? Just being, going from part-time to full-time was the biggest step ever. I wasn't, a, I had never eaten steak before in my life and I was 20-odd. I was brought up by way, like, so if you had cornflakes, 
then they have milk, he put water in them. Or, unless he nicked somebody downstairs his pint of milk. That was the only way you'd get milk and your tea and your and your cereal. We were brought up in a hard hard community, you know, it was like uh, if you didn't eat, you had to go and find something to eat. Summertime was great because you could go and raid somebody's orchard of strawberries or peas or whatever. That was the only way it was and if you had to pinch things, you had to pinch things because that was the only way. But when you start going to a club, you'd have a pre-match meal. A pre-match meal for me was like, I've won the lottery here. I'm having beans and toast on a Saturday before the match, chicken and chips. Well, no chips, but you'd have chicken. Pasta, you'd have things like that. Everything was done. So your whole body started to change again. You'd get stronger and you just knew that the, the, the stuff that they were putting in you was for the better and I was becoming stronger and probably more, well, it was healthier, certainly. And then your mind and things like that, I enjoyed. I, I, I loved it. I, I could tell the difference in everything from being part-time to full-time. Did it change you as a person that suddenly you're, you know, you've gone from Queen of the South to this big, iconic football club, Glasgow Rangers. Did you become a bit more self-confident? Maybe a bit full of yourself? Well, as a kid, it was a, it was my dream to play, to be a footballer. If a teacher said to you, what do you want to do? I would say, I'm going to be a footballer. They would stop asking you after six or seven times. We, John, wanted to be a fireman, a policeman or a nurse. And they would come to me and he'd just skip me. He said, I've, I've, I'm not getting that answer, Ted. And that, it was, that was my dream. It's, I think in anybody that plays football, to do something that you enjoy doing and training, to me, I love training. I love playing on Saturday. So you're getting paid for something you wanted to do, there ain't a better thing in life. Like any sport that anybody does, golf, rugby, motor racing, you want to do that and you're getting paid to do it, it's the best life ever. And in playing in front of 50,000 fans, there's nothing bigger. Because you get that you get that buzz, you get that going through your blood. There's just nothing better. And it's, for me, the bigger the games, the better it was. You suddenly must have got the adulation though. You'd be out, you'd be recognised, you'd be... Maybe. Yeah, he's recognised. Yeah, chased ladies and blokes. Um, but it it was trouble coming with it as well. You know, it's just it's not it's not just um, you we could walk, go into a pub in Glasgow and it'd be the wrong pub, it'd be Celtic. So you're straight away you're well you 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 you're, you're not asked to leave, you're just you leave. Uh it, but that's in any way of life it's different now because that you shouldn't be in, but well, I don't think they go in pubs anymore. I don't think they're allowed to go in pubs to players, but it's just one of them things that you went in the wrong part of Glasgow and you banged at the wrong person. You knew about it, so it was just a matter of being in the right place and and got the right the, the right bits. Come on, man, tell us about old firm Celtic versus Rangers. Great games. I mean, lucky enough, I only lost one. Well, even losing that one, and I'd seen how bad it was for the players and the fans. The staff, the whole bit was just was horrible. And that was the very first one I played in. I think Morris Johnson scored the one on New Year's Day. We lost 2-1. After that, never lost another one. And beating them and being in their faces was, was brilliant. And Glasgow, you own Glasgow then. It's like us against Forrest down the road. It, you, own, you own Glasgow for that time until the next game. And lucky enough, I never lost another one. So it was it was a great feeling. and. To see the fans, like, so celebrating, like, 65,000 or 50,000 or at Hamden, 75,000, is absolutely fantastic. Intimidating? You are very, very, and you just, it's, nowadays, well, then it was just, do not get sent off, and if you can get somebody sent off, get them sent off. So that never really took a long time for me to settle in, so my first target was get the full box sent off and get them doing it 10 minutes as quick as I could. Any one particular game of Rangers Celtic that you played in that stands out? League Cup final, winning two one, winning any final because um, you've got something that you can keep hold of at the end of the day. Um, again, a Glasgow Cup final, which is a, a, is quite like we used to play Chesterfield for a derby in Chesterfield. There was fifty thousand at that game, and we, we beat Celtic three 0 on a Friday night. End of season, and you're just thinking this is just a a small cup, the Glasgow Cup, and we've got a sellout crowd beating them at any game. But for me, it was just that was my dream signing for Rangers. So things could only get better for me. But when, of course, when Graham came in, everything everything changed at Rangers, and 
be, from being more a player to being a bit part player, started to become a bit more regular. All right, we'll talk more about the change. <clears throat> I want to ask you about this because last week we spoke to your good mate from Derby, Tommy Johnson. When he phoned you and said, Ted, I'm going to play in Glasgow, and then he told you that he was going to play for Celtic and not Rangers, what was your response? Well, I never it wasn't Tommy's biggest fan anyway when he was at Derby, but he just went right. You're as thick as thieves. I know he he was. He's a good, he, but when he told me he was going there, I said, "Why are you going there?" And he just said, "Because I think he had connections before. We had quite a few players there anyway." And I don't know who who signed him at Villa. Was it on you? I don't know who signed him at Villa anyway. He was he went there, and Brian I Brian Little signed him at Villa. Brian Little signed him, so he's went there, and I was in I was actually in Glasgow at the time, and then Tommy was up there, and he and he popped in one day and and give Kevin his season tickets for the season and I said to my dad, you know, you're not using them. He said, I'm dad. I said, you're not going to watch them. So Kevin ended up being a bit of a Celtic fan because of Tommy, but Tommy used to rib me and, and send messages and all that, we'll beat you again, another league title. I don't know how many Tommy won with Celtic, but it was one too many, whatever he won, but he, he, he done well in games up there and he scored goals. Tommy, wherever Tommy's been, he scored goals. Um, either he meant them or he didn't mean them. His pace got him out of trouble all the time. But for him to go there was a bit of a, it was a bit of a dagger in the back. I'm but just looking out into your garden. I'm amazed you allowed your grass to be green that you painted blue. Yeah, I'm. Might as well not let me change that yet. But we've only just moved in, so it gives a bit of time. Call next time you pop around in four years, that grass might be might be black and white stripes. You never know. <laughs> it, it, it's. Uh... We have the rivalry Derby and Forest, but I think it really is difficult to comprehend how intense that rivalry is. Any that I when when I was in Rangers and Celtic, it, it was just pure. It was hatred because it was religious. I think Morris Johnson changed that, um, but it, it it was. I am a religious person, so it, for me, we never shook hands at the end of games. It was just a matter of. If you were in a if you were in a club together, the two teams would when they when they be together, you would never acknowledge each other. So it was just a pure hatred, and then you had the fans in the back of that that would try and wind you up, try and get in a fight, and and that's the way it was. And I think that's the same, in, not so much in any derby, but certainly come to this derby. I mean, I played in the, the Knicks with Seville and Betis, same city. Um, a, more or less the same as Rangers and Celtic because it's a, they're in the same city. But you got to remember, Glasgow's got about seven teams in it. So it, it, I think in any derby, you've got to respect your fans and think there's hatred between the, that club, Birmingham Villa, derby them along the road. So you've you've always got that. You, you're you're fighting for the fans and you're playing for the fans as much as anything else because they don't want to get beat against their cl closest team. So. I, I always took the, all these games, all, any derby except Birmingham Villa, I took them as, as, as so serious. It was a matter of we win at any cost. Makes me smile, you can't even say their name. That. I don't, this, I, I, I would, I might, I mean, I never knew that they call Ajax, they call them uh, the postcode. And the, the fee and odd fans, they'll not say Ajax. I would just call them along the road A52. I would just say derby playing A52. I would, I just, I mean, I just dislike the place. <laughs> I think we've, uh, I think we've got that. Although Tommy said that actually he used to have some Sundays out in that place down the road in your playing days. Yeah, the Rodney at Woolerton, but I didn't, I don't really class Woolerton as Nottingham. It's a wee bit just before. Um, yeah, we had, to, we had a few Sunday sessions, which um, I think Arthur found out after a few, few while when we used to. Get boys knocking in from the side to to make me and Tommy head it, which wasn't really comfortable on a Monday morning, um, and then walking about with a sick bag a wee bit later. So, yeah, we had we had, we had good times in a, in a Sunday, me and Tommy. Enough on that. So let's go back to Rangers. Graham Sooners comes in and it all changes. Yeah, everything changed. Co David Cooper was always the the, the number one winger, um, and Sooners would sometimes play with two years, but in most of the European games. Um, and then he, he tried to make me be a striker uh, when Colin West got injured. But he, everything changed. Um, Butch came in, Terry Butcher came in, Chris Woods, Graham Roberts. 
And then it was the big Matt Walters, Ray Wilkins, the Steve, Trevor Stevens, Gary Steve, everybody started coming in. So I knew that my days were numbered and I knew I wasn't going to get a lot of games. And um, I got, we actually played again, again in Germany against Bermuda and München Gladbach. And just after that, Jock phoned me from Seville saying that Seville wanted to sign me. This would be November. And he just said, you interested? And I said, I'd be very interested. He said, right, we'll, we'll keep in touch with you. Never heard anything for another three or four weeks. And then Grameson has pulled me up and said, Seville, what are you signing? But we're now selling for 200,000. So the, 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 the deal's done. And then Jock told me, he said, we've not got any more money. So I just, and then I stepped out of line at Rangers um, and got banned for two weeks. And... Um, Jock said, why don't you fly over here? So I flew over there and signed with Seville, which is a bit strange, actually, but the Rangers accepted the deal when I got suspended um, for two weeks. And um, Can I ask what for? Um, break and cuff you, um, because I knew the game wouldn't be on the Saturday. We played Celtic on the New Year's Day, and we were playing Motherwell two days later, and there was about six, seven inches of snow. Motherwell didn't have under soil heating. Didn't they have covers in the sheet, and um, me and a couple other players went out, and um, they found out the two player, the other two players that had went out owned up, but the third person didn't own up, and um, I was the third person. <laughs> hmm. So I got a heavy thousand pound fine, and suspended for two weeks. So, and I found out that that was the longest they could suspend me. So. I think, uh, and then the deal was back on. Um, Rangers then said, we'll take the 200,000. Walter Smith didn't want me to leave. Um, I didn't want to leave, but I knew that everything at Rangers was changing, everything. Um, and I, and I, I felt that I was not going to be a part of that. So was the attraction Spain, Seville, or was it Jack Wallace? Both. Abroad, playing abroad, because there wasn't a lot of um, British players playing over there. Playing against Barcelona, playing against Real Madrid, Atletico Madrid. Jock, playing with Jock again, because Jock had signed me once, and if I was bad, he would never have signed me a second time. Um, so that attraction of playing abroad, playing at these stadiums, even though they were never going to be full, because they had huge stadiums over there that they couldn't get half full. So that attraction to go over there and was go was always going to be appealing and. I wasn't going to say no to something like that. So how did you find it? Did you adapt to it? Adapted to it. My first game was against Caddies, um, which was quite a local derby. It was four hours drive, but for Seville, that was a drive where everything else was a plane. Um, going down there, and I was safer with the ball than I was without the ball because people would just take you out. and Because you were a foreigner, because you were English, or they, like they would call you, British, you know, like, so, and they would, they, 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 they just didn't like it. Um, and then I broke my, I broke my foot after the first game. Uh, broke my second toe playing squash. That didn't go down well with Jock. Um, I was the chairman, on me playing squash. So that wasn't a very good start. The language was the biggest barrier. The language, there was nobody spoke any English. Jock, well, so Jock would have a team talk with me, in Scottish, and then he get an interpreter to talk to the players in Spanish, what he wanted, but the players, it was it, the, the language was the hardest thing, and I knew after a few months um, that that was going to be the biggest problem, because I would be running about the field shooting solo, mainly unless that was on my own, and I was never getting the ball, because I wasn't saying left or right in Spanish, I wasn't trying to learn the language, and they wanted to try to really help me be a part of the team, but I did start getting lessons, and I got, I started getting more into it when I could, when I could understand what the players wanted. And um, sadly enough, it wasn't long enough for Jock to keep his job. So um, Jock got the sack for having a bad pre-season, which isn't really heard there. Um, but we didn't win many pre-season games, and the chairman decided to get rid of Jock because they had a bad pre-season. But if that happened nowadays, we'd have been, you know, managers after the 
Come and you've been Barry. Even more managers change. Well, you be playing Barry Walsh Vicks or something like that. Prem's every every pre season, so he so he get some results. But it was it was sad that Jock got and I knew that was me back to square one again. Rams TV meets Kevin Clifton McMen. And then a man who'd come to watch you at Queen of the South eventually gets to sign you. His name's Arthur Cox. It's February 1988 and you arrive at Derby County. I seem to remember being called in on a Sunday to Radio Derby and I'm thinking it must have been to either interview you or Stuart Webb who was out there doing the deal and no sooner I had got the call than it was all done, you were signed. Yeah, uh, Mr Webb came out, um, I think it was Mr Baxter's boat, it was harboured at Marbella, uh, he came over to Seville, and i never forget, we went in a hotel, and there was a few other clubs, Newcastle were interested, um, I think McFall was the manager then at Newcastle, William McFall, yeah, yeah. William McFall was manager, and I had the gig to go to Newcastle, and uh, by phone, um, Everything was deal everything was a done deal and then Mr. Webb turned up at the hotel. We we're playing Betty's the next day and Jock said, Listen, you've got to talk to Derby. I said, I've I've said, I've already said yes to Newcastle. I ain't gonna go back on my word. He said, Listen, let me sit and talk to them. Went in the hotel room, Mr. Webb said, This is this, that, that. It was never about money. at any of my in my end of my career I never ever played for what I, what I thought was worth. Whatever somebody ex offered, I would always say that's what I'm worth. And then Mr. Webb sat down and said, right, what's the problem? I said, there's no other, I've already agreed. He said, right, speak to, the, speak to the manager. They then phoned Arthur, and Arthur got on the phone. Straight away, that's another Jock Wallace. The way that he was talking on the phone, I want you, I've followed you for five years. I've chased you for five years. I've watched you so many games. And I thought, this is somebody that, that wants me to go and play for him. And I ended up, saying I'll sign and I thought there's no way I'm going to go back go back and Arthur against Arthur because I knew that he would come and get me one day and I probably wouldn't have been in a good place because he, he can't walk about saying I'm going to sign for you so the next thing Jock said you have to phone Newcastle because he can't even just text him anymore no he's like I'm not signing because we never had phones in them days so I ended up having to phone Newcastle and Paul Goddard said he can remember the manager getting called out at a team meeting because it was quarter past two. And the, the, the person who knocked at the door and said, there's a call for you, and who is it? And Paul Goddard said, I remember them saying, hey, Ted McMinn's on the phone. And Willie came and said, to him, what's up? I said, I'm signing with Derby. He said, don't go to Derby. I said, I'm going to Derby. He said, I'll give, you, I'll give you more money. I said, it's not about money. He said, but you've told us. I said, listen, Derby's come out here. And Ted McMinn. Flown out the way to here. They want me to sign. I've signed. I hadn't signed. But he said, can I change your mind? Let me get back to you. Let me get back to you. I said, no. I said, I really appreciate you having an interest, but I'm sorry. I'm going to go to Derby. And I did. And I, did. And, and I, would never, I never regretted it because I always... I did when I seen the pitch. I regretted it. But I remember... I thought Newcastle, we were in a relegation battle at the time, and I think that season they might have went down. Newcastle might have went down, and we just we just stayed up. Yeah. And and I thought I'd done the right thing, and I knew with the players that Arthur had that this wasn't going to stop there. He was bringing players in. We only had a squad of 16, 17 players. It wasn't a, the luxury of having two teams. We had a, and Arthur was bringing players in. And I looked at him, and Gordy, you know, Gordy was a physio then, and Roy Mark was there, and I just thought, yeah, I've done the right thing here. I like the stadium. The stadium was very, very tight. Everybody was in toppy. Um, and then 
my first game was at Portsmouth away. We lost. And then my home debut was against Man, Man U. And I can't believe you have only just seen the goal that you scored that night. Yeah, first last last week my my, my son sent it from from Germany, and I just said, "Where did you get that?" And then you tell me that it's been on there for ages. And I I always go back to the games that I played in the eighties. I could always come up with a two two game, but I could never get. I never seen that goal, and that goal that ball could have went anywhere. That could have ended up in Swaxton. It could have ended up anywhere. I mean, I hit that and that pitch. And the first comment that somebody says, a lot of great, a lot of grass in that pitch, wasn't there? And there was not one bit of grass. You hit it top corner. Derby lost the game, but you made your mark. You'd arrived. Yeah, I did. And and I was lucky that, I, and I didn't play well because I remember the game and knocking at the manager's door and saying, "Listen, I, I, I'm better than that." And again, the answer would be, "Get out of here." Um, and 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 I was lucky. But I think we're a club. You go to a club. You've got to win over the fans as early as you can because I was at Derby and there was a lot of players that didn't and it never ever gets any better. Derby fans like wingers? They do like wingers, but there's no winger anymore. Tommy Smith was the last winger Derby ever had. There's, there's, there's not a winger anymore. There's, it's went out the game, it's stereotype. You, It's like tram lines. It, the, you know, like Gary Michael White, Nigel Carlin, there was three wingers. We could all switch. There was never a matter of you stay that side, you stay that side, you're a number seven, you're a number 11. It was never like that. Wingers were, wingers, but I think fans liked it because you were two feet away. You know, you could you could take a corner and have a drink of somebody's bovril <laughs> and give them it back, take the corner because they were that close. You could hear every comment that, for the pop side. You could take a corner on the pop side, somebody could have a rant at you, you could answer it back quite easily and then you'd have the cowden stitches because you shouldn't be listening to what they're saying, but I think straight away that you have that that association with the fans, that's that's half your battle won. The following season was arguably Derby's best in what was the first division, now we call it the Premier League, 88-89. Um, it's yourself there, you've mentioned Mark Wright, Goddard and Saunders up front, how could you go wrong with those two up front? Mark Wright at the back, Peter Shilton in goals and you finish fifth in the first division and win away from home at a lot of places arsenal villa well i don't think derby have won ever since um 13 games we won that season yeah yeah which was a club record which i think we've got a, we all got presented with uh, shields after it i don't know if it got beat or equaled i think i think it might have got equaled yeah i think yeah but let me take you to white hart lane tottenham october november 1988 and probably your best game for Derby. You absolutely torture the Tottenham defence and Derby win 3-1. I think after going behind, Mark Wright scored a goal and you scored the other two. Oh, Cole, cool. you got that wrong. Have I? That is no like you. Dean Saunders got the third one. Did he? Yeah, we, 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 went, we did go 1-0 down yeah. and then Mims was in goals. Bobby Mims, and he was having the worst time ever. I'll never forget reading the team, Jimmy Cyril's sheet that we used to read. Uh, on a bit of A4 paper that got passed in the dressing room about your opponent, what to do, take them inside, take them outside. Um, he didn't have any videos then or games, it was everything. And I remember it was shoot on sight. Bobby Mims was like going through a right bad time. And I was at the, my first goal was on the touchline, probably eight yards along the touchline, but right on it, tried to blast it across and he's bent down, hit his thigh and went under his, between his legs and went in. Second goal, remember right he gave me the ball, I must have watched that goal about 15,000 times. All them hits that I've seen that, that's just me. Because it it was one of them, and i never forget the commentary. Because Graham done the commentary in it. The, the one, and I remember, I'll never forget, right he gave me the ball at the halfway line and running it, Marbet and Tom, Thomas, Tom, Thomas? Probably. Uh, running it and putting it between them, smacking it across, goals, Mims again. Probably came out and made it a bit easier for me. Then celebrating and then realised that I'd run to the wrong fans. Run to, had to go back along behind the goals because the Derby fans were in the corner, <laughs> which was great vision again. But um, and going two one up and then Dino lobbed. I think Dino lobbed it. This might be. I'm well, sure Dino happened. lobbed the third one. I think Mims came out and Dino lobbed it. But there again, you might be right because Dino scored the year after that when I got injured. But I'm I'm still stick to. McMinn and Saunders for the three goals. All right. You could be wrong for once. 
Christmas occasionally. <laughs> um, so it's a great season. You win at Arsenal, la virtually last game of the season. Dean Saunders definitely scored that day, lobbed it over, and uh, Derby went 2-1. And you're then on the verge of Scotland call-ups, aren't you? Yeah, 20, I think it was, we played West Brom on the Wednesday and we beat them 2-0 in the League Cup, uh, got us through to the last eight, which we played Villa. And then, um, again, it's one of them grounds that you go to and you think, oh, I enjoy playing here. Don't know if it's because it's a bigger, again, it's a bigger, big club. Um, and then, again, Tottenham's pitch has got that slope. Um, and it was right in front of Tottenham's dugout, right, Venables were sitting there. Uh, the, I'm sure the radio lads, I don't know if it was, they were still where, more or less touch side as well. And I remember going over um, and I could hear a lot of tearing and, and I knew my leg was gone. I can hear Venables shouting, get up and stop diving. Um, I can remember Gordy running, running at the dugout. Um, Arthur saying to Gordy, is he all right? I knew that I'd, something had gone wrong because I remember Gordy lifting my leg up and my leg was just hanging. Um, and then I remember Arthur saying, run it off. And I was just like a wounded pheasant. I got up, run a step and just rolled over that, that side. There was nothing, there was nothing in my leg at all. Everything had gone straight. I, I, don't, I think I carried off. It wasn't this 10 minute delay, get a stretcher, wrap them up. I think it was just like, God, they just grabbed my two arms, dragged me to the side of the pitch and just said, right, in the medical room, um, Tottenham done everything then. It was scanned x-rayed they knew how bad it was wrapped it up in cotton wool bandaged it and i slept back in the dressing room and i remember arthur saying we, we beat them was it two what did we beat them two one or we won the game we, we won the game i remember arthur saying get in the bus and i'm thinking he's not even like so well done lads and and everybody was dead dead quiet and i'm thinking because i remember they asked gerard to put, to put me in the underground and get him back to his car where he'd parked outside london and I'd still have my kit on. I thought, I ain't going in the tube with a pair of shorts and a derby top on. They were thinking, I'm a right saddle here. With a leg covered in cotton wool, bandaged up to the uh, top of my thigh. And I remember getting on the bus, I was in agony. And we used to have cans of beer in the bus then. We had one case of beer amongst 16 players. So you'd have about a can and a half each. And Arthur said, you're not having any. And I thought, it might get rid of my pain gaffer. So now you know having one. Got I knew well then it was arranged when I get back to Derby to go straight to the hospital, see Mr. Cargill, who had got out of his house on a Saturday night, eight, nine o'clock at night, at the at the, um at London Road, and he just looked at it and started shaking his head and he just said, We'll operate first thing in the morning. Just remind us what you'd done. Snapped the the the, um, the cruise had snapped, the medial had snapped, I think everything inside had snapped. Um but it, 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 the strange thing about that, that started something then, because we had about nine players that roughly had the same thing. Stevie Cross, Justin Phillips, Rama, a lot of players had the same thing. Um, maybe no as bad, uh, but it was, I knew it was bad, and, and, and Mr. Cargo, but they would never tell me how bad it was. And of course, it, the World Cup was coming up, and that was probably the best I was ever playing. How did you cope with that? You and Gordy became good friends, didn't you? Well, we and Gordy were always friends anyway because I, I spent that much time with him. But it straight away, it, it was a long-term thing and Lily Shaw then came into it because it was long-term. We had a small... Gordy couldn't look after me every day. But the the bad thing for my, mine is four weeks after the operation, I then got a blood clot in it. Um, and it was the day I was supposed to get married. Um, and I had a blood clot and... It, my foot was black. Went to Mr. Cargo. He just said, You've got a blood clot from your foot, and we don't want, we can't get, it can't go any further into your knee or even further up. And he said, I have to take it off now, and you're, you're in the hospital for a week. So I knew then that I thought, This 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 injury is becoming an absolute nightmare now. It's not just the knee, it's like your blood clot. And then I had to go to a cast, and then they put a caliper on so we could start stretching it and keeping it mobilise it and things like that and then it, the Lily Shaw become then straight away after Christmas you go straight to Lily Shaw for six months solid. Was it, it was over a year before you came back wasn't it? I didn't play, my, I didn't play again till Sheffield United 
January. Um, yeah, 14 months I was out. Yeah. I came back and done pre-season and big Justin Phillips done main training, um, which didn't go down well with the gaffer. Um, but big Justin, I felt sorry for because he told me to get up, but I, he'd snapped my, my cartilage. And again, back to the Nuffield, Mr. Cargill, see what you can do here. And uh, there were never small injuries I got. I always got the, I always went for the full Monty ones. I never, never wanted a small one that I could be back with in a, with a couple of weeks. But it was just one of them things that it was a part of that knee again, which might have been something that was protecting. Or I came back too early. I mean, I knew that I, I was pushing things and Arthur was saying, slow down, slow down because it was never going to be a, a short, short-term short thing. You did eventually come back. Derby got relegated from the first division into the second division, and inevitably, the group of players start to change. Your old mate, Mark Wright, goes off and joins Liverpool. Dean Saunders leaves. Paul Goddard leaves. And there is this sea of change. Could you see that maybe your time and your position within Derby was starting to ebb away? Yeah, which, I mean, I was player of the year that season. And then Lionel was starting to bring in, like you're saying, Tommy, Kitts, um, Gabardini, Shorty. Um, players were starting to come in and I'm thinking, that, that's my position. So you're, th- you're, you're, you're then straight away thinking, if he's bringing players in in my position, this is going to look good for me. If he's bringing defenders in, I'm thinking, that's great. But the old school was starting to go out and it, and it was making Derby a better team. And then Arthur sucked me down pre end of pre-season and said, you ain't going to be my first choice or my second choice, but I want you to keep your dressing room happy and don't 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 like to uh, disturb it and things like that, be winding you, you know, getting the game and things like that. And I still had another year of my contract left and Arthur said, I'll give you another year. Bring the kids along in the reserves which was Rammer, Paul Williams, Stevie Taylor, John Davison, all the younger lads were coming through, Kevin Francis, Brett Angel. Um, these lads were all coming through, the under-18s. Help them, bring them through, keep the dressing room happy. Um, and then let's see what happens after that. And I knew then, I, I think that season, I probably played on the bench, probably 14 games of that season, and just come on when, when, it, when Arthur needed me. And it, it worked. Eventually, then you go to Birmingham. So let's draw a veil yeah. over it because you clearly don't want to talk about that. And then go to Burnley. And if I remember rightly, you played in an FA Cup tie for Derby at Burnley. I think it finished 2 2. Was the replay abandoned because of fog? Well, and then eventually it got played again. And off the back of those performances for Derby, they signed you? Well, Jimmy Mullen, I remember taking a throw, throw in one uh, right in front of the Burnley dugout. And Jimmy Mullen says, uh, Anytime you want to come to this club, just give me a ring. And I'm thinking, I'm only taking the throw in here. And I've just been offered a job. <laughs> so right. so I thought, I'll take, I'll take all the throw-ins and maybe sign the contract by when I get a corner. But I remember Jimmy saying that, and I remember when but I said to Burnley, I, I don't want to be here. Burnley were the first club in. Hearts came in. Uh, there was another couple of clubs. But when Jimmy came on the phone, and he just said, listen, we want you to come here. They were just outside the playoffs. Um, and I went there for a month's loan it, with the deadline finishing, but I could still sign like after that. Um, and I scored something like three goals in four games, and then I never scored a goal again. I was on loan there for a month, scored goals, and Jimmy just said at the end there, we want to sign you um, for two, in a two year contract. We got in the playoffs, um, and Matt Patterson and Schultz were at Plymouth at the time, and it was strange playing against Pato. And Schultz being a manager, because Schultz was, was always a goalkeeper at, at Derby. And going down there in the playoffs, they ended up third, we ended up sixth. We drew 0-0 at Tough Moor. Patty absolutely kicked in the living daylights at me. I was cut and I was black and blue. Wasn't really going to be playing in the second game because of, I was badly cut up for the first game. But going down there, I'll never forget reading the paper that Plymouth wanted to extra buses for Wembley when they beat Burnley and Jimmy Mullen put that on the board. And said, read that in your way, lads. That's what their chairman thinks. We ended up stuffing them. So, and Patty came in with a bottle of champagne at the end of the game. But I said, I said to Patty, I said, um, thanks for them two kickings. He said, uh, that's, that's why I went and played the other wing. He said, because 
I was sick of you kicking me because you never got a kick of the ball match. <laughs> <clears throat> That's an old teammate of yours, Mark Patterson from Derby. So we go to May 1994 and you go to Wembley with Burnley and you win. And I mean, it wouldn't happen now, but they open the gates and me, Graham Richards and Ian Hall decide to wander into Wembley because Derby are playing against Leicester there the next day. Who was the first person we bump into walking around Wembley Stadium? Ted McMahon. I think I was still celebrating the second goal. And, uh, <laughs> but I remember that it's because I, I was looking forward to it the next day. Um, I mean, I think it was about 35,000 here at the Stockport game. Two players sent off. Again, one was caused, well, they reckon that I got both the players sent off. But anyway, they were doing nine men, but beating them was great. And he, he actually see what's happened with them now. They're, in, they're not even in the conference, they're below the conference. Um, but it was one of them things, it was, I thought this is a great weekend, I've got Derby tomorrow, really looking forward to it, we've just won the playoffs, got my medal, really looking forward to going away after, like, pick watch Derby, and then get from the dressing room and said to the gaffer, I'm stopping down here the night, gaffer, I said, I'm going to Derby, Derby game tomorrow, he said, no, we've got an open top bus, I said, no, he said, you know, miss me, he said, no, everybody, chairman wants everybody up there, we've organised it straight after the game, and I thought, well, I've got a ticket here, and I'm not going to go and watch Derby, and I was gutted actually. Because I guess all your friends from this area were all down there. Yeah, I mean, loads. Of, I, I I couldn't get enough complimentary tickets. I was asking everybody for tickets for because a lot of the, the the Derby fans and I'd went down for the weekend and there was there was people outside Wembley like after they left you, um, outside just hanging about, just looking forward to tomorrow. And, um, it, it, and I, I was gutted that I, that I missed it because. Spending five and a half years at Derby, you want to be there to see to see them doing well because I'd just done well at at, at Wembley, and winning there in a playoff. There's no better feeling. From Burnley, you end up in Australia. How did that come about? I just had to get out. I had to get away from Derby within 24 hours, and I thought if I go to Australia, there's no way anybody's going to find me out there because it's a big place, and they'll never think I'd go there. I ended up making calls, getting things terminated, my contract and getting everything to get away, just to get away and disappear for a wee bit, which was again selfish, you go back to football, but that was just me, I would I would think of something and I just thought, right, I can't change my mind. I'm going over there and playing, it's like playing, a professional going and playing Sunday League, that was the biggest drop and I thought I had to come out here, but I was still playing football, so, but the standard was 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 a lot lower. But I decided to do that, and I wasn't a professional footballer anymore. Eventually, you come back. You do all sorts of jobs, doing some coaching with your old mate Mark Wright. But you eventually end up back in the Derby area, and you start working with me and Ross Fletcher on the radio, and we're having great fun following Derby. But then, was it the summer of two thousand and six? Five. Five, was it? Um, something that literally changed your life. Yeah, it, it, it definitely changed my life. It, I mean, it's, it's actually 12 years, 5th of October, that I had the, the top bit of my, my leg taken, well, I'm just below my knee, which, which is, it, yeah, it's changed, it changed anybody's life. You, it's just something that happened. We still scratch our head how it happened, you know. Do you know? Now, now people go back to doctors who even say about injections he got as a player, which I had loads of injections just to play football. I mean, it would never happen nowadays, but it, it probably does. But it's them days, it was, you're out of the team, you, you're struggling to get back in it. So it was a matter of any cost. With, it, with that, we, we don't know if something got in with a cut, um, a bite. Something got in there and started eating away the bones. So the time they got in there, there was there was no bones left. There was bones, but they weren't connected where they're supposed to be. But like I've said before, there's nothing they can join on your foot. The next parts to take off four inches below your knee. And being, I know it's being selfish, but it's the best thing I've ever done actually because I don't have to walk with crutches. I don't walk. I'm not in a wheelchair. Um, I can do work forty hours a week, and it, yeah, I'm, pay, I'm in pain every single day. But if you're not going to have, do something, you, you know, you, you can't sit on the couch for 40 hours and 
feel sorry for yourself. You got to get up and, and do what you what you got to do. And we've all got bills to pay. But having your leg amputated is clearly no no slight thing. But was it exacerbated? Was it made worse by the fact you were a f- former professional footballer? You were people's vision of you that saw you play for Derby is tearing up and down the wings and obviously you need two legs for that. And suddenly, and you still to this day don't really know why, it all changes. No, because that's part of the tool, tools of your trade, isn't it? It's like a, it's like a joiner, it's his hands. That was my, that was my, my weapon, that was my main thing on my, my right foot. But it's, it's one of them things, when it happened and I went in a wheelchair, I said to Marion straight away, I can't go in a wheelchair. That, to me, looking up at people was the hardest thing ever in my life. And after one time in a wheelchair, we got it, chucked it in the garage, and then started to learn to walk again. Getting it, got my artificial leg, when the stitches were still in, and they said, Look, you've got to wait until the stitches are out. Started walking in a palmy straight away, walking between bars, and they said, you're rushing everything. But that is me all over, exactly the same with my knee. How quick can I get back? How quick can I walk again? So for me, it was the quicker you learn to walk again, the quicker you can be normal. You can go back to being as an amputee. I don't class myself as disabled. I would never say walk into somebody and say, oh, you're the odd one because you're disabled. I would never class myself. I can do as much of, yeah, I can't run, but I can do, I can push a shopping trolley. Um, I, I don't class myself as a disabled person and I don't really want anybody really to say, oh, that's that disabled Ted McMinn over there. Uh, to me, I'm... And my, my my kids and my my, my grandkids, my, my my granddaughter thinks she got bitten off by a crocodile. I mean, I don't know what age I'm going to tell her by the <laughs> way that that didn't happen. But one day I'll have to break the bad news to her. But to, it's you know she takes my leg away and hides it and things like that. You know what I mean? Because that's the way she's been brought up with that. I remember you holding it up in a car when we were driving somewhere. Yeah, I, well that's to get a bit of parking space. You know, we, we had to take the leg off, right? Because we said, listen, is this guy is disabled. We said, how, how? I said, yeah, take this off and we put it in the dashboard. But it, it, it's, it, 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 to me, Colin, it, it's 12 years now and people say, how do you cope with it? You, you wake up in pain every day, but that's life. Everybody, there's a, a lot more people out there worse than me. In May 2006, the two clubs that love you the most, Derby and Rangers, come together at Pride Park, 33,475. It's still the record attendance for Pride Park Stadium. But actually, if you hadn't have known where you were, you thought you'd have been in Glasgow that day. I have never, ever seen anything like it with the city of Derby taken over by the red, white and blue of Glasgow. The Rangers fans and the Derby fans still talk about it. When I go back up there, there's still people post it in Facebook. You know, like uh, this time, so many years ago, this, and you see the pictures, that, and they loved it. And then when they came down for the second game, they'll they'll just say, oh, and a lot of them didn't get back. I know it was, a, it, like, so they were saying, oh, I never got back for two or three days, I got the wrong trainer, I went to London, and it wasn't even facing the right way, and somebody broke his leg, and they they absolutely loved it. I mean, Rangers fans and the Derby fans that day, I would say we split. You know, the ground was split, but they all mixed with each other. And for me, the biggest fear was that that wouldn't happen. You were always thinking, I remember growing up as a young lad, England and Scotland. They, was, they used to play the Texaco Cup. Chesterfield got wrecked by Rangers fans. Sunderland got wrecked by Celtic fans or whatever. There was always the England and Scotland thing. But it's not like that. Rangers fans come down here and they just want to show what the clubs are about. They all support the club through thick and thin and they have done that and, and Derby's exactly the same. Derby's had bad times. Fourth division, they're back to where they are now and they want to get back in the Premier League. So they and, and you hear them whinging, you know, that this they'll still be buying their season ticket come April next year. They what else would they do, Derby fans? They they they, they, they go there, I don't know what I remember after when when, when I signed here, the season tickets were a lot lower because the baseball ground was small but i remember they used to always make a big sign in just before the ticket deadline day of the season tickets and then there'd be a big big demand for them and it used to happen late on and but now it's all changed but what's derby season tickets this year 20 odd thousand 
they love the club. They will, they will get them stick, and they and they deserve to get stick because they pay good hard cash to go and watch the club. And but the game's moved on so much now that he just he, he, the the fans now with the Wednesday games, the, well the Monday games, the Friday games. Football's all about a Saturday. You know, it's not about a Friday night or a Sunday afternoon or a five thirty kick off. Three o'clock on a Saturday or a Tuesday night when it's swap it for the world. And finally, Kevin Clifton McMinn, to go back to where we started. Any regrets? No. No. Being selfish. No, I wouldn't even change that actually. I I wanted to play football as a kid. Um, 55 next week. Yeah, I'm gonna change it. So great to talk to you. See you, mate. You still awake? <laughs> I thought you'd nod off. I thought you'd nodded off. Hi, I'm Ted McMahon. That's my life on Rams TV.